in Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, the Lamb and the seven-sealed scroll, if you would stand for reading of God's Word. And I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll, written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And you can just about just hear heaven clapping. 
clapping, thank you, Jesus. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and the four living creatures in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, which would be Jesus, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the, on the throne. This is the word of God. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we are getting a view of heaven now to prepare us for what is coming in chapter 6 through 18, the carnage that will come on planet Earth. And we are seeing the one on the throne who will open these seals and carry out these judgments that are coming. We know that our Lord Jesus is in control. Right now, it seems like humanity is in control. Oh, no. Our God reigns. Our God is in control. Our God is indeed sovereign. In him we trust. In him we bow. In him we are waiting for his return. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Open our spiritual eyes to truth today. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Now, you know what the theme of Revelations is? Thank you, thank you. It's Revelation, that's right. Jesus is coming, and judgment is certain. Last week, we started with the throne of God in chapter 4, and we saw the we saw the 24 elders, we saw the four living creatures, and the four living creatures constantly are going, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And the 24 elders, every time they hear that, they fall before the throne, and they say, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. And I believe we are the 24 elders that are bowing before the throne, and I'm going to make an even a stronger argument for that today, so hold on, hold on. We must, we must know that in the chaos of our world, God is on the throne. God is in control. Make no questions about it. Even though things are frightening now, there's future events that are going to unfold that will make this pale, this pale compared to what is coming. Now, the reason that you're feeling uneasy, the reason you're feeling uneasy is well-founded because look what has happened to you in the last few months. You have had a sequence of events that really is unparalleled in our world. Let me just review a few with you. You know these. The COVID virus paralyzed not just America, but the world with fear. It's a new virus. It's going to, we have no immunity. It's going to kill millions of people. That's what you were told. That's what you were told. And then the world mobilized together in a common cause to fight the virus. Hmm. A common cause. And listen to this. Humanity, for the first time in the history of planet Earth, quarantined healthy people. Quarantine healthy people. That was the first time ever. And it was all because of science and safety, and you felt something's strange in Denmark. Something's weird here. This is weird. Families were separated. Church families were separated. Strife came into families and into situations in life because of the pressure of us being isolated. We're not meant to be isolated. We're communal people. We need to be together. And then there were several things that we saw our government do that, that they classified as essential. Liquor stores were essential. Pot shops were essential. Planned Parenthood, the murder of baby machines, was essential. Walmart's was essential. Amazon was essential. But you know what wasn't essential? Tens of thousands of small businesses that went under and may never well come back. That was not essential. The economic impact we, we have not experienced yet. And then on top of that, we had lawlessness in our streets. And they, they cloaked it in the Black Lives Matter movement. Folks, these are anarchists. We believe in black lives. We believe that in, 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 in liberty and justice for all. We know that there's been an oppressed group in this country. We know there has been progress in that area. We would have to admit that. But this thing is all about capitalism and socialism and uh, capitalism versus socialism and communism. That's what this is about. Something is wrong. Where is the law in America that you grew up in? This is like El Salvador. This is like... Nations that have devolved. We are seeing things happening in our street that would be very uncommon. We saw some of this in the 60s, but not like this. This is different. This is an overthrow of a, of a, of a, of a nation. There was an all-out effort to develop a vaccine. And by the way, we skipped the animal trials. 
And some people believe that embedded in the vaccine are markers to be able to track you. And finally, to, in order to get survival goods, the, the government has mandated that you wear masks when you go into a store. Now, maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, but they have mandated this so that if you don't, you cannot buy survival foods. Now, think about this. Just extrapolate from that. If you don't take the vaccine, quite possibly, just it, this is a postulate. I don't know this will happen. But what we are seeing with all this science, control, safety, anytime you see science and safety, think control, there might be a time where if you don't have the vaccine, you don't have the marker that they can detect in you, you may not be able to go to the store. Isn't that something to think about? Yes. And folks, we are one president away from a globalist agenda being thrusted down a free people. One president. And John sees something that we need to see as we are feeling this discomfort. John sees the throne of God. John sees Jesus on, in heaven as the Lamb of God. He sees on the throne of God, God with a, with a scroll that's going to be handed off to Jesus. And planet earth will be taken back and Jesus will reign on this earth. He sees this happening. We pick up our, teacher, our teaching today with the Lamb and the seven-sealed scroll with verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on a throne a scroll written inside and on back, sealed with seven seals. Now, first of all, I want you to notice who's holding the scroll, who's holding this title deed is God the Father. God the Father has it in his right hand. It's the Ancient of Days. And it's written on inside and, and on the back, this is, a, this is a deed or a will and testament of judgment. This is judgment that is coming. So what is the scroll? The scroll is the deed to planet Earth. It should come up on the screen. The deed to planet Earth. Yes, it is. The last will and testament for planet Earth. Charlie Garrett says this. Have you ever heard of Charlie Garrett? It's Superior Word Ministries. He's got a big Internet ministry. This guy is smart and he is well worth listening to. So that's a plug for Charlie. He says this, The seven seals are significant in that the ancient Roman wills were sealed with seven seals. This is certainly what is being referred to here, a will or a title deed. Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 6 through 10, will give us some indication of a title deed. Ezekiel is a prophet that is speaking to the nation of Israel as they're going into captivity. The nation of Israel, or Judah, has rejected prophet after prophet after prophet. They bought into all the gods of the nations around them, and now God says, no mas, no more, and they're going into captivity. And Ezekiel is, be, is told this, and you, son of man, God speaking, do not be afraid of them, nor afraid of their words, though briars and thorns are with you and you dwell among scorpions. Don't be afraid of these people who are like scorpions who might try to sting you. Don't be afraid of them. Do not be afraid of their words or be dismayed by their looks. See that we get all kinds of looks because we're Christians. Though they're a rebellious house, you shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, they are a rebellious house. Now, you just hear that. You must speak your words to them, like the prophet, whether they hear or whether they don't hear, that is our responsibility to give this truth to the culture around us. And then he says in verse 9, that now when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. Then he spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and on the outside, inside and out, judgment, written on it were lamentations and mournings and woe. The nation of Israel has seen a scroll before of judgment, and they went into judgment. And we are seeing before the throne of God a scroll that is telling us in chapter 6 through 18, judgment is coming on planet Earth. The main thing that you want to get from this is when you are interacting with the culture, do not be afraid. Even though they're scorpions, do not be afraid. Whether they hear you or not, we are to tell them. We have a message of hope. We have a message of truth that we have to give the world. Tell them anyway. Tell them. Now, why all the chaos on planet Earth? Why all the, it's, been, it's been this way from the beginning, right from the fall. It's, it's, it, 
ramping up as we get closer to the end. Why all the, why all the chaos in our streets? And I want to suggest to you, when you see Antifa in their black outfits, and you are feeling a little uncomfortable with them, it's a spiritual battle. There's kingdoms at play here, kingdoms of darkness and kingdom of light. These people are human beings that need to hear about Jesus. That's what they need. So we have to get past that. Mayors and governors have ceded control to the evil. They have bowed to the evil of this, of this nation and allowed this to go on. And we're praying that God will intervene and put a stop to this. Now, you need to realize this. Satan does have temporary rule on the earth. It's a point to remember. He has temporary rule. He usurped this rule in the garden with Adam and Eve. But I want you to hear this. God owns all of this creation. This earth is God's. It is not Satan's. He's a, he's a trespasser, so to speak. Psalm 24, 1 and 2 says this, The earth is the Lord in all of its fullness. Psalm 83, 18, That they may know that you, whose name, a Lord, no, name alone is the Lord, are most high, El Elyon, over all the earth. Psalm 89, 11, The heavens are yours, the earth is also yours. Yours in Deuteronomy ten fourteen. Behold, the heavens and the heavens in the is the Lord's thy God. The earth also with all that is therein. So let me ask you a question. Now you're going to get A on this question. Who owns the earth? God owns the earth. That's right. Let's try that again. Okay. Who owns the earth? God owns the earth. You got that right. So you must realize that Satan does have temporary control. There were three times that Jesus said this in the book of John. 1231, he calls him, the ruler of this world will be cast out. In 1430, he says, the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing on me. That's what Jesus is saying. In John 1611, the judgment of the ruler of the world is the ruler of this world. He's going to be judged, and he was judged at the cross. And in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, he's called the God of this age. The little God, the little Elohim of this age, small g. And he's blinded the minds of unbelievers. So I want to show you something. I have a little thing here that shows you what Satan has done to planet Earth. All these people thinking, I'm free. I can do whatever I want. I can sin with impunity. You are locked up in chains. And when this is a picture of a human life, thinking that they're having everything great and wonderful and terrific, and Jesus comes into a life with these bolt cutters, and he goes, pop, pop, and these chains fall off, and you are free. You are free. What a picture. What a picture. Yeah, I like that. Now, if the earth and everything created by, is created by God, and he's in control, God is in control, how does Satan have rulership? What in the world happened? Well, I want you to know that he's called the anointed, Lucifer was the anointed cherub. In Ezekiel 28, verses 12 through 15, we see say, Lucifer in Eden in a mineral garden, and you see all these gems that are in the mineral garden, and then you see Satan falling in his hubris. He, is, he tries to ascend to the hill of God, and he tries to take over. Listen to what it says. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth amidst the fiery stones. That might be the sapphire, the turquoise, the emerald, and etc. that were in the verses before that. You were on the holy mountain of God. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. And then what would happen to Satan? He was cast out of the mountain of God. I cast you out as a profane thing from the mountain of God. And from then on, the battle was on, and Satan conspired to get planet Earth back. Now, I want to show you something. In Genesis 1.28, Adam and Eve are given dominion over the Earth. They are called theocratic administrators. Now, there's a little overhead here. This is, this is from Andy Wood's work, so i got to give him credit. This comes from Andy. God is supreme ruler. Man and woman, man and woman was to be the administrative ruler of earth over all creation. They were to go out and they were to populate. They had authority over everything that was on earth. That is the picture. Now, I want you to think about something. Well, before I say this, Tony Garland says this. Dominion of the earth was originally given to Adam, Genesis 1, 26 and 28. 
and it was lost to Satan due to sin. I'll tell you, this was like the worst thing that ever happened on earth. This was a seminal moment for humanity, and Adam and Eve made the wrong decision. But guess what? If you were there and you were Adam and Eve, what do you think you would have done? Yeah, okay. As a result of getting the first man, Adam, to join his revolt against God, Satan usurped tenant possession of the earth away from its original tenant, which would be Adam. Satan has been exercising administrative control of the world system against God ever since. Satan's masterful scheme started in the garden. Now, there's a whole bunch of points here that will not be on the overhead. So you're going to have to listen. You're going to have to hear this. So in Genesis chapter 3, we have the fall. The temptation is to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they just caved right into it. Satan gains back through deception what he lost in rebellion. And all of humanity suffers. Rulership of earth is, is, is cast away, and death came into the human race. Adam's sin resulted in the death curse being credited to every person, Romans 5.12. God's law requires that there be a kinsman redeemer, someone who is a blood relative, someone who is able to pay the price, willing to pay the price. That is the kinsman redeemer. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. He is a blood relative. He's a perfect son of God. Adam was perfect. He was the only sinless person on the earth, he and Eve, before the fall. Adam's sons and daughters all had sin credited to them. They, they cannot redeem the earth. It has to be a perfect one like Adam. And so God sends his son into this mess. Only a sinless son of God could redeem us. Jesus is called the last Adam in 1 Corinthians 15.45, a perfect, sinless son of God who would redeem mankind. As Adam's kinsman redeemer, he paid the debt for Adam's sin with his life with his life, and redeemed Adam's stolen property, planet Earth, and all of Earth's inhabitants. Only Jesus can have and open the deed to Earth. He's the only one that can open the scroll. Jesus is the only hope of the world. No other world religion gives you this hope. They're all false. They're all false. That's not popular. That's going to get you somebody scowling at you. But it's the truth. We are to give people the truth. This is an important concept that we have to grasp. There is no sinless Savior in Buddhism, Hinduism, or Islam. In the worldview battle, this will come up on the screen, in the worldview battle, never forget, never forget, Christianity is the only world religion with a sinless Savior. Oh, let's do that again. Christianity is the only world religion with a sinless Savior. And you said, amen. That's right. Good job. Verse 2 and 3, who is worthy to open the scroll? Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and the lucid seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it, to even look at the scroll. No one. So we're introduced to a strong angel, mighty and powerful. And there's a lot of noise in heaven, isn't there? Trumpets blasting, loud voices, proclaiming with a loud voice, indicating urgency. And then the the urgency is this, who is worthy? John knows there's something going, who is worthy to open the scroll? This is so important. Who is worthy? See, there's been many people who were willing to open the scroll throughout history. Many Many tyrants have been willing. Despotic rulers, Genghis Khan, Napoleon, Hitler, Mao Tse-sung. There will be a coming Antichrist who's willing to to, to open the scroll, but he can't. None were able. Remember, Antichrist will lead a one-world government, a one-world political system, a one-world religion. You know what he does to humanity? He dooms humanity, everyone who follows him. None in heaven, none on the earth, none under the earth. No being in the universe was found worthy to open the scroll to open the book, or even look at it. John, feeling the weight of this truth, laments that the earth is being lost, and he is grieving. Watch what he says in verse 4. So I wept much. The earth is lost. That's what he's feeling here. 
because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. I wept much. This, this, the word is kaleo, and it means to sob or wail aloud. It's what Jesus did on Palm Sunday when he came into Jerusalem, and he knew that he was going to be rejected. And he knew that the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD was going to be leveled. And Jesus wept, wailed, cried deeply. Same thing with Peter when he denied Jesus three times. He wept, he kaleo, he sobbed, he wailed. No one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look at it. The outpouring of emotion is because the universe, there's no one in the universe that can do this. Who can do this, John? Tony Garland says this. John evidently understood the significance of the scroll and the great need to open it, to read its contents. From this we understand overwhelming sadness attends any future which continues apart from redemption. Oh, if there's no redemption, everything is lost. There is no hope. But God sent his son. God sent his son. On his own initiative, Jesus came, and he died for the sins of mankind. If he hadn't come, we would have been forever lost, forever lost. Thankfully, man was not left abandoned to history of a self-perpetuated depravity. And remember this, history is his story. Let me say that again. History is his story, God's story. History then has its center, Jesus Christ, and the goal is the triumph of, to reign over all the powers of the world. We must realize God's plan for redemption came before the foundations of the world. God wasn't just simply watching mankind and, like I've said many times, biting his nails and go, oh, I hope they don't do that. Oh, that's, that wouldn't be God, would it? See, God is outside of time. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He sees, he sees the whole timeline. It's already played out. Why did God do this? Why did he create us? If he, if he knew that Satan was going to, that Lucifer was going to fall and take a third of the angels and, and most of humanity would, would, would give him a stiff arm and say, we don't want you, God. We want our own God. We want to make God up the way we want him. Why did he do this? Let me read this to you. This is, this is a quote from me, but I want to make sure I get it right, okay? <laughs> God's amazing love for his creation was the impetus. His astounding love for, for, for his, was the impetus for his creating those he knew would rebel against him. God had the solution for mankind's rebellion before time began. Having a people who would love him, hear this, having a people who would love him, serve him, and live, for him, live with him forever volitionally, not puppets, volitionally, was worth the sacrifice of his only begotten son. And all we can say is, thank you, thank you, Father. Thank you, God, for your plan. Thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because they all, remember, they're all overlapsing. This, this over, over, overlaps one another. They're all involved in this decision. Acts 2.23 says this, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. That was Jesus being delivered. Foreknowledge is, just, is simply prognosis, and it means to know beforehand. The giving God gave his best, so those in rebellion against him could live forever with him. Folks, we call this amazing grace. What was the song? Amazing grace, how, great, how sweet the sound could save a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. It is amazing grace. And remember this. The book, the scroll, is in God's hands. He's in charge of human history. He has a definite plan and purpose for the universe. If everything is under God's control, that eliminates me having to worry about, oh, no, what's going to happen next? How many people worry about China, Russia, a rogue Iran, some Islamic country with a bomb, with an atomic bomb, and oh no, they're going to slaughter a bunch of people, and we worry about that sort of thing. Don't worry. How about how many people worry about a raging virus? And oh no, it's not going to be contained. Or lawlessness in our streets, and anarchy, and Marxism, and then climate change, and globalism, the massive problems of our world. And we worry about these sort of, sort of things. Everything seems to be out of control. Mankind left to themselves will self-destruct. There's never been a weapon made that man has not used. You need to realize that. 
We use it all. Nuclear, chemical, biologic, they'll use everything. But you have to remember this. Behind all of this, but God. I didn't put but God up here, but I wish I would have put a great big for Chris to put up. But God. God is behind. God is in charge, not mankind. God will bring history to a climax, not humans. It's not going to be humans destroying the earth by climate change or whatever we think we're doing here. Mankind's rebellion against God will come to an end. God will establish righteousness throughout all of his creation. And hear this loud and clear. Jesus is coming back to secure freedom for planet earth. And might I add safety? Don't you feel like you need safety? He's going to provide safety for his people. It'll be so wonderful to live with Jesus forever in his kingdom. Safety for, safe forever. In view of this, let me ask you this question. In view of this, the believer is to be the most optimistic person on the earth. Now, are you having a little trouble being optimistic today? I can't help it. I mean, I'm a cup half empty guy. I want to be a cup half full. You know, I want, I'm working on this. I'm trying to change this. Oh, Lord, help me to see things through your eyes. It, let me get back on track. When I get into stinking thinking, I have to go right to Jesus and say, oh, Lord, I'm sorry, and I'm going to turn my eyes upon you and away from what I'm looking at out here that's causing my tribulation. It's good to know that in a world that's devolving right before our eyes, God is in control. Do you, how, do, how would you answer that question? Are you becoming more optimistic or pessimistic? As we go through these teachings, I'm hoping that you are able to make a transition from being pessimistic and, oh, everything is falling apart, to being more optimistic and saying, Jesus is in control and Jesus is coming. Now, that's easy. You know, those are easy words to say. We've got to walk this out. We have to live this out. We have to do it. You know, Christianese is easy. Living it's a whole different program. But, you know, you have the Spirit of God within you. You can be an overcomer. We can be optimistic about the future. Verse 5 and 6, we can be optimistic because Jesus is coming to the rescue. Yay! But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah... The root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, that's where Jesus is, right at the throne, actually sitting at the right hand of the throne of the Father, and of the four living creatures are before the throne. In the midst of the elders, which I believe is the church, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Hmm. John continued to weep, but then there was good news. Finally, an elder steps forward. There is one qualified, John. There is one qualified who was able to redeem what Adam lost. And can you feel the emotion with John? Can you feel it? I mean, he, he must have just went, oh, oh, it's like you get the diagnosis. Or when, or when Lee was having his surgery, his, his, his brain surgery for the cancer. And we're waiting for these hours, and, and then the surgeon comes out, and the surgeon says, we got everything. And we just felt this drain of emotion. Where's Ludwin? Is Ludwin here? Wherever she is. I mean, we, we, just, we, are, 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 we just went, oh, oh, thank you, God. Now, this is nothing to what John is feeling. But we, could, we have something we can empathize with here. He gasps with relief. Who is this one? Who is he? Well, it tells us the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the root of J David. This is Jesus coming at his second coming, acting as mankind's kinsman avenger, his kinsman avenger, avenging what Satan had stolen, taking full control of planet Earth. The redemption price for humanity has been paid. Now it's time to reclaim it's re reclaim what is rightly, for, rightly belongs to Jesus, all of his creation all of his creation. Jesus overcame. Jesus died for the sins of mankind as our kinsman redeemer. There's going to be a screen that comes up next. Don't do it yet. <laughs> In the midst of the throne are four living creatures that we see the lamb, the lamb of God. 
Jesus came the first time as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This would be it, Reagan, this is it. Our kinsman redeemer. Oh, he died for us. He paid the price for us. He was willing. He was able. The only one that could do it for us, and he did. And now he's coming a second time as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. The Lamb of God has come. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, is coming. Our kinsman avenger. And he is going to take back planet Earth. No questions. And don't miss this about the Lamb. Having seven horns indicates power and strength. Remember the horns in Daniel? Persia had the two. Greece had the one big horn. These are power. The seven eyes. Seven is a, is a number of completion. Complete and perfect knowledge. And then the seven spirits of God. We were introduced to this in chapter 1. We know as the Holy Spirit sent to all the earth at Pentecost a universal outpouring of the Spirit to every man, woman, and child, every slave and free. Anybody can have the Spirit of God if they receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. But the Spirit's before the throne. And Don, tune me on to this on Tuesday. The Spirit's before the throne. Why is the Spirit before the throne? Let me give you a hint, 2 Thessalonians 2.7. He who now restrains, which I believe is the Holy Spirit-filled church, will do so until he is taken out of the way, the Holy Spirit-filled church is taken out of the way, and we have a picture here of the church before the throne of God. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? This is so important to realize. Everything that we have been, that you have been hearing and I have read to share with you is true. Everything that I'm talking about is true, and on the horizon, these things will happen. These, will, will, these things will take place. Life on earth is getting messy. Would you agree? Life on earth is getting messy. And it's good to know that soon earth's mess will finally end and be permanently dealt with. Jesus is coming back. How many times have I said that in this talk? Jesus is coming back to make all things right. Yes. So, and when I wrote it, I don't know if Chris wrote it. Let me say what she said. So. Is there a so up there? And so, oh yeah, she put little dots there. But in mine, I put so, a whole bunch of circles. So, do not fear. Do not fear. Amen. So Jesus takes the scroll from Father's hand. Watch this in verse 7. Now this you want to listen to. If you've been cycling in and out, this will be a time to cycle back in. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Think, only God can take the scroll from God. You think some angel is going to walk up and say, hey, give me that scroll. I can open this scroll. I can undo these seals. You think some elder, some high, you know, highfalutin Christian that's in heaven say, I'm going to take the scroll. No, only God can take the scroll there's no, no, remember, nobody in heaven, on earth, or under the earth could do it. Tony Garland again says this, Having stood, Christ now takes the scroll out of the hand of the Father. As Christ initiates these actions, the world slumbers below, listen to this, oblivious to the thief approaching in the night. See, things are happening here, but things are also happening in heaven. And earth is oblivious to what is happening there, unless you're coming to a teaching like this. Now, we have a picture here, and I, I, just, I just like this. I mean, this is the Father. He's so nice and gentle, and he's handing Jesus a seven-sealed scroll, and Jesus is going to be the one that opens the scroll. The only one in heaven, on earth, or under the earth is Jesus Messiah, our kinsman redeemer, our kinsman avenger. He will open the scroll. I like that picture. Now, there's a plea to all unbelievers. Wake up. Wake up. And there is also a plea to believers. Don't fall asleep. Now, I know it's easy right now to fall asleep. I mean, it gets a little warm, and you get to hear my monotone. and you... Wake up. Wake up. Do not be oblivious. Have eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. Do not slumber. 
Do not slumber. Keep watch. Now, hear this. There's a major change from Jesus' priest role to his king role. This is big. Now, remember, Jesus occupied all three positions that you would see in Israel. He came first as a prophet speaking the words of his father. Remember, I only speak what my father says to speak. He came first as a prophet. Now he is our high priest sitting on the right hand of God. You, you read Hebrews chapter 8 and 9, and that's right in it. Jesus is our high priest. And what is he doing? He's advocating for us in 1 John chapter 2. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's interceding for us. We can boldly approach the throne of grace. Jesus is there for us. But there's a change that takes place in here. And it happens before the first seal judgment is opened. Watch this. A change takes place. The lamb becomes a lion. Christ is, is no longer pictured on the Father's throne. He's gotten up, and he moves, and he stands up, and he takes the scroll. He's changing his role. He's changing his role. That's an important thing to remember. Christ is not on the Father's throne. The age of intercession has come to a close. No more intercession for the church. Why? Why? Why do you think? The church is where? The church is in heaven. There's no more need to intercede for the church. The high priestly role is over, and it happens before the first sealed judgment is opened. This is a great argument for a pre-tribulation rapture. Now again, now look it. I'm all fervent about this, but I could be wrong on this, okay? So if it doesn't happen just this way, immediate leap forward, to Marv Rosenthal or Joel Richardson, go get their book. But right now, this is the way I see it, and I think there's lots of evidence for it, so no more intercession. Jesus' priestly role will end, and soon Jesus will assume his final role as King of kings and Lord of lords. And we see, we shall see, we see Jesus acting in an entirely new character. And I believe the age of the church is over. Another pre-tribulation rapture consideration. What we are seeing is happening future. While the Lamb's taking of the scroll, the events of history take a turn toward the redemption of all that is God's, taken back from the dominion of Satan. Once the Lamb rises from, the, rises from his position and takes from the right hand the scroll, the die is cast. The seal judgments are imminently going to be opened. I mean, I don't know where Jesus is. I bet Jesus is looking forward to this. He's on the throne, and for the first 2,000 years, he's kind of leaning back, and he's doing his thing, interceding for us. And as he gets closer, he kind of scoots up on his seat, you know. And it's like when you get ready for recess, and you're in the third grade, and you can't wait to get off, and you're just waiting for the bell, and Jesus is just waiting. Okay, is this it? And he just leaps up and says, oh, great, and takes the scroll. Yeah. When the last of the seals has been loosed, and it loose the trumpet and the bold judgments, then we will hear these words. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever and ever. The whole creation that groans in Romans chapter 8 will be released. See, we, we go to the Grand Canyon, we go, oh, this is beautiful. It's fallen. It's fallen. It's the, it, this is a re result of a cataclysmic event, the flood. Just think when it's all new. I mean, it's an incredible thing. On the cross, Jesus said, it is finished to tell us die. And the purchase price for humanity was paid. And now Jesus is saying, it is finished. It is time. It is time for me to avenge what has been taken. It's taking back what Satan has stolen. Jesus Christ is sovereign. He alone walks over and takes the scroll of destiny out of the hand of God. He alone is worthy to execute and carry out the events in the following chapters. Who is worthy? Jesus is worthy. Okay, that was pretty weak. Okay, let's try it again. Who is worthy? Jesus is worthy. Oh, that's so good. You guys are great. Whatever. Closing. Yay, closing. History is marching toward a decided end. John has shown us that the church is gone. I believe it's in heaven, seen as the 24 elders. We know that presently, Jesus is in his priestly role. 
When Jesus rises from the right hand of the Father and takes the scroll out of the Father's hands, he is entering into his king's role, no longer interceding for his church, which is, which is his priest role. Again, this is a strong pre-tribulation rapture argument. Next week, we will conclude chapter 5. We'll get more insight into the 24 elders, more evidence that the elders are indeed the church. We are on an exciting journey. Wouldn't you admit that? This is exciting. People throughout the history of the ages wanted to see our time, and we are seeing it today. We are on an exciting journey. Soon we will see the first sealed judge. Well, I don't think we're going to see it, but soon someone will see. I should have put someone will see. <laughs> the first sealed judgments open. What they mean and how all these judgments culminate in the return of Jesus Christ at his second coming. And just think this, life on earth is changing right before your eyes. Perhaps the time is closing in when the Son will take the scroll out of the Father's hand and the seal judgment, number one, will be peeled open. Oh, it could be so close. What a wonderful time to be alive, to witness what we are witnessing today. Hold on tight. It's going to get bumpy. It's going to get bumpy. Hold on tight. It's going to get interesting. We'll have more insight as to where we are on this on November the 3rd. Isn't that the election, November the 3rd? I got it right? Okay, November the 3rd. Okay, good. Because whoever is elected, think about this. The global agenda will take a quantum leap forward if Joe Biden is elected as president. Our job in this this ever-changing, radically changing world is this. First of all, no fear. I will not fear. My God is with me. He is in control. No panic. Trust God. Stick together. Stick together. Draw strength from one another. Hebrews 10.25, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. You can't encourage one another if you're in your living room or if you're on your phone or if you're on the radio or listen to this on the radio, we encourage one another as we are in a group together. It's very important as we encourage one another, even more as we see the day approaching. It's more and more uneasy. Look it. We need to tell the people the truth. Like Ezekiel, if they want to hear us or don't want us to hear, we need to tell them. Even if they don't want to hear the words, we need to tell them. Even if they're like scorpions, We have to tell them. They are people that Christ died for. We cannot look at them as an enemy. We have to look at them as potential people coming into the family. God saved us. He can save them. We must realize that. Many of the Psalms ended this way with the word selah. You know what selah means? It means carefully weigh the meaning of what has just been read or heard. Lifting up our hearts in praise to the God, to God for his great truths. May we together say Selah. When we contemplate what we have just heard, Selah. Carefully weigh what has been said. Lift up your hearts in praise to God. Remember, it's all true. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Selah. Weigh what you have heard. Jesus is coming soon. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that you've given us to study your word. This is the precious, inerrant, infallible word of God that you have given to us today. Holy Spirit, each one of us has heard something that you have had specific for them. May we not just be hearers of the word, but may we do whatever it is you're telling us to do. If someone here does not know you as their Savior, oh, Lord, I pray today is the day that they will say, yes, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I receive the gift of salvation. I believe that you took all of my sin debt. I will live for you, Lord Jesus. Oh, just do that right now. If you have never done it, do it. This is a critical time. You were created to have a relationship with your Creator. And it's all through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, everyone should have their communion cup.
And everyone, oh, I have spilled my communion cup. And it's, no, I'm good, I'm good. Oh, no, I spilled, I have most of it here. Thank you, though. Chris knows how much I need my help meet. So have that ready. And as always, we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, I want you to remember, as we do every time we take communion, it is a memorial. We're remembering what Christ has done for us. Remember his broken body. Remember his shed blood. We do this in remembrance of him. This is a memorial. We're also saying, as the bride of Christ, what does Jesus want us to do? Watch and be ready and remember. Watch, ready, remember. Be ready. The bridegroom is coming for his bride. Be ready. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Right now, I just say, Thank you, Father for the gift of your son. Thank you for him taking my beating. Thank you that all of the wrath for everyone was poured out on the Lord Jesus. I cannot imagine for all the sins of the world. In that wrath that was poured out was all of my sins and all of our sins. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you took the wrath so we don't have to take it. Thank you. Thank you for your broken body. Thank you. Take eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, Lord, we are thankful for the cup. We are thankful for the blood of the Lord Jesus. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. There is only one person in the universe one person in existence that could die and that his blood would take our sins away, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. And we say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son. Thank you for this memorial that we have. We do this in remembrance of you, Lord Jesus. Therefore, whoever drinks this bread or, or excuse me, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And then a caution. And we're going to do this in just a second. I'm going to be playing a song on the overhead, and I want you to introspect, introspect during that time, or, or now, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Very serious. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep or have died. So we want to make sure that you're very serious. This is a serious time. We want to have introspection, look at our lives, examine ourselves. Father, have I laid everything at the, at the foot of the cross? Have I put everything there? I'm holding nothing back from you. Forgive me my sins. Forgive me for my wrongdoing. Thank you that you've washed me and made me white as snow. That if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. What a wonderful verse. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Jesus, that your blood has cleansed us from our sins. This we do in remembrance of you. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. You would take your elements. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and said, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. We thank you, Jesus, for your broken body. But we don't have the words. We just say thank you. Something we'll say throughout eternity. Thank you. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant of my blood. This do often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Thank you for your shed blood, Lord Jesus. Thank you.
Our Father, we're so grateful for this time together as the family of God. Thank you for allowing us to meet. We still have the freedom to do that. Thank you. Thank you for each person here, all these Bible students, Lord, that are so interested in learning about your word. Thank you that you've put your spirit into each one and that they are, have such a passion for the infallible word of God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are in our midst. Thank you you are doing your work of healing and restoring. Thank you that you are our strength. You are the rod of iron up our spine that allows us to stand. Lord, when the people come with their words, when they try to sting like scorpions, may we respond with the gentle voice of the Spirit, speaking to them words of truth. Again, thank you for this time together. We love you, Lord. You are so wonderful and great. In Jesus' name, amen.